So flowing fluid, so we have this pipe and we introduce the idea of the energy associated with the flowing fluid. In this case, the mechanical energy associated with the flowing fluid. And so if I look at purely mechanical, I had a kinetic, a potential, and then a pressure volume kind of potential. When we do this formulism, we have to consider the inlet and outlet to our system. So now we have flowing fluid coming in. So we have an elemental volume. And so we have to define an elemental volume, and we can do that throughout. Here's another picture at the bottom of our elemental volume. So cross-sectional area times some delta x gives me an elemental volume. Once I define that elemental volume, so up here I have my elemental volume. My elemental volume doesn't change. If my elemental volume is equal to one centimeter cubed or one milliliter, it's quite big for elemental volume, but you could do that if you're dealing with, right, um, let's say you're working at a power plant, right? or you're working at the water purification factory, elemental volume of one centimeter cube is pretty small relative to these big, huge industrial type things. Nevertheless, to find an elemental volume, you need to do this. It doesn't change. So if the surface area, my pipe got cross-sectional area, right? It was a funnel type pipe. So in order to maintain the same uh, elemental volume, my delta x has to increase. So I went from a pancake to kind of a cylinder. So I talked about the energy associated, the energy associated mechanical energy of a flowing fluid that had a kinetic, a potential, plus a pressure volume kind of potential piece, had three pieces. But I want to look at, so a flowing fluid that consists of mass, so I could not be so specific and just say mechanical, I could say mass. Energy associated with the flowing fluid, or just the, kind of the total energy. In this case, I still have my, go up top, I have my uh, kinetic part, I have my standard potential part, gravity over a height, pressure volume, and now I have to add this internal energy. This is my internal energy per unit mass. Typically, you define the internal energy of a system. So internal energy is what? In regards to the first law. What kind of a function is it? What kind of a function is internal energy based off the first law? It's a state function, right? The internal energy, right? There's an equation of state, right? There is an equation that's great that describes the internal energy. So given that it's a state function and you learn the state postulate, how can we define the internal energy? So temperature and pressure always work. So, but typically, for this piece here, you, we don't look at the, you know, what you'll do traditionally throughout the rest of the, the course when you're solving problems, when you're dealing with the internal energy part, especially of a flowing fluid. In that case, you don't really, con you, sometimes you're concerned with the pressure, but typically it's just the temperature. So as the temperature goes up, the internal energy goes up. Temperature goes down. Of course, there is, it, it, is the, it has to be defined by two, but typically you just say, okay, it's incompressible fluid, right? or something like this. So we could put this energy associated with flowing fluid in rate form. So it's basically a dot above that. Take the time derivative of this. I get that, and then I can simplify it to a version like this, where now I have <coughs> dot 
equals m dot times everything that was here almost. Now, and this represents it's a mass flow rate. So I have my element of volume, the amount of mass crossing going through that volume per unit time. So there's a, mono, there's a mass in this elemental volume, right? It's a volume. Say it has a density. We can put a non-uniform density, but let's not do that. Let's make it simple. Uniform density within my elemental volume. Okay, I know the density. I know the volume. I can calculate the mass, right? M dot is dm dt. So my elemental volume isn't, in this context, and in most contexts, isn't changing, right? It's staying constant. So this represents the amount of mass going in and out of my elemental volume. Or if I draw a plane and say my hand is the elemental volume, right? There's a certain uh, cut off my wrist, right? And here's some plane. There's a given mass. If I go really slow, what is the mass transfer? DMDT across this point of reference. So if I, one second, say my hand weighs 100 grams, 100 grams per second, right? Go really fast, say it crosses in a nanosecond, that's not quite a nanosecond, but then it would be 100 grams per nanosecond would be the mass flow rate. So let's do a simplified case of a thermodynamic system. So my thermodynamic system here is constant volume, constant density, and steady flow. So an example case of a system that has mass flow in, constant volume, constant density, and can't, can't constant mass flow rate. Now I haven't defined whether the, vol the mass in here stays constant or not, but I could have a chain, you know, I could just shut this valve off and have constant mass flow rate in, then I would have an increase in mass within my system increasing but let's do this. So I have it like that. I have my system. My system has a boundary. So I've drawn my boundary. What is the form of what, what can cross the boundary? Energy. What types of energy? Right? Heat and mass. In this case, I have mass coming in. I have my boundary here. So I've drawn it in this 2D form, but really it would be three-dimensional, so I'd have a cross-sectional area here. Inlet, right, area of my pipe or tube. So I have mass coming in. So let's write out the energy associated energy, mass, flowing fluid in. One half mv squared, so this mass coming in has a velocity, right? There's some height relative to some reference. Likewise, I have some height relative to a reference.
we're on, let's say we're on Earth, so gravity's normal. There's a pressure of this within this elemental volume. It has a density which is constant, so that means that the specific volume is constant. They're the inverse of each other. And I, there's an internal energy associated with this mass coming in, which can be defined by temperature and pressure. So the energy of flowing fluid in is written like that. So I can use N equals one. So I basically have one half M1 V1 squared plus M1 G H1 plus M1 P1 V1 plus M1 V1. I can do the same thing for out. Say out with a subscript equal to. I'm going to put this expression in rate form. So if I do that, all I do is I take the derivative of everything above. Okay, so now I'm taking the derivative of all of this. So I have to use chain rule differentiation. So if I just look at this one, I got m dot times v1 squared over 2 plus m, m over 2 times the derivative of v1 squared, and then plus, which then I have to do the standard you know, differentiation, m dot times gh plus mg times h dot plus m dot times p p1 v1 plus p dot times m1 v1 plus v dot times m1 p1 right so i'm just i'm just doing this right product rule and so i end up having this big long messy right expression which describes the rate of mass coming into my system. The rate of energy, right? The rate, the energy, the rate of energy do, of mass coming into my system. But we did a simplified case. Constant volume, constant density, steady flow. So let's, I said all that in words, so let's write it out before we simplify it. See, it gets pretty messy. Right? Took the time derivative of it. I had to do all that. I, I didn't even. I didn't finish that part up yet. Uh, does H one change? I'm just writing out the full thing. Okay. Right. But we're. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you guys to so you know to do this. And then you think about the problem. It's like, wait, I just said constant volume. Constant. Equals zero. Well, this equals zero. This whole term's gone doesn't matter what anything else is, right? That whole term's gone, right? Well, I, that's a, kind of a blur. It's really the dot above there. But you get the point, right? Constant volume, right? That's kind of built in. Steady flow. Right? We can simplify it. So let's write out some box and for the simplified case constant volume 
constant density, steady flow. What's that? Sir, thank you. So constant volume, big V dot equals zero. Constant density, specific time rate of change, you know, specific volume is equal to zero. Steady flow, there's no change in velocity, right? It's coming in at constant velocity. I didn't specify this, but given it's constant volume, we never said anything about it changing in, in temperature or pressure, the inlet. So the, it's coming in at a, it, what you're getting is always the same. The temperature and pressure of the mass coming in or out is always at, say, room temperature, atmospheric pressure. So U dot, and I didn't specify this, but this is coupled with steady flow, is that the pressure within my in control volume of the mass coming in is not changing in time. I said it, it I coupled that here because u dot is a function of p. So if this was non-zero, then this would be non-zero. So I could do it on inlet and outlet, right? So I have I put the subscripts here. Internal energy of the mass coming in, or time rate of change of internal energy of the mass coming in, time rate of change of the internal energy of the mass leaving. Velocity, so the acceleration, right? Acceleration of the mass coming in, acceleration of the mass leaving. And so we define a control volume, so even if my output diameter, my system up here, if this diameter is different, it still has the same volume. So given all of this, I can simplify this equation. <coughs> and it just becomes 1 half m dot which is what I wrote earlier. Now steady flow also implies that m dot 1 equals m dot 2. So I could just say that it equals m dot. Remember, this term represents, so I, I did that analogy with my hand crossing an interface. So if I split this room in half, right, then there'd be a boundary that separated, you know, the two halves of the room. So if I was to run back and forth, right, I would be the mass. At some point, the rate at which I'm transferring across that boundary is going to slow down because I'm going to run out of energy, right? So, but anyway, so I, so this represents the rate of mass transfer into my system. Kilograms per second. Now steady flow also gives me
so the rate of energy input or output from my system by mass is equal to the rate of energy input to my system by mass. It's a steady flow problem. So I have mass coming in at a rate and it's leaving at a rate. These are equal to each other. And then I could just write it out as m dot So in the quiz that you're going to have next Tuesday, I talked about defining your system and writing out the full energy balance, right? And within that variation of the first law of thermodynamics, my system can have mass coming in, it can have heat coming in, and it can have some work input, and it can have mass leaving. It can have heat leaving, and it can have some work output. In this case, when I write the energy associated with mass, I can use these types of expressions. I said steady flow. We're going to introduce these terms steady state and non steady state. So, steady state implies that 90% or more of the time. my system down here, I have mass coming in and I have mass leaving. I have an internal energy in my system. Steady state means that the change, the time rate of change of change of the energy of my system is equal to zero. I say 90% of the time because you can make some arguments that it's steady state where this doesn't hold, but some other things have to hold. But in this class, steady state is going to mean that this happens. E dot system. So let's go back to the first law. Energy in, energy out equals the change in energy in my system. And I can put it in rate form. By putting a dot above it. Which equals the T <coughs> of energy in. Which equals the DT work in plus heat in plus the energy of mass I can 
do the same thing for out. So putting dots above it. If it's a steady state problem, so I put, I brought my first law, I took my first law, wrote it in this energy balance form. I still needed to draw my system with the boundary and whatnot. I put it in this energy balance form, so I have all the forms of energy coming in, minus all the forms of energy leaving, is going to be equal to the change in energy in my system. I can put it in rate form. So the rate of all forms of energy in minus the rate of all forms of energy leaving is going to be equal to the rate of change of all forms of energy within my system. Internal energy, everything within the boundary. So this, when I look at this equation, means that Whereas non-steady state implies nearly 100% of the time that that is not true. So again, I have my energy of my system. This is showing a snapshot at some point in time, right? This picture here. It gives me a snapshot of my energy, of my system, the mass coming in and the mass leaving at some point in time. Say, t equals zero. I'd have to draw another schematic, which would kind of be a cartoon representation of what it looked like at some time later. Say, one hour. At some time t. Then I would have E1, so the change in energy, internal energy, everything within the is going to equal E2 minus E1. Now, as an example of non-steady state, let's say that I can sit here and I can turn a valve on and off. But I have water from a water tower coming in, and that valve is always open. So I got water coming in. And it's, there's so much there and there's so much you know, energy. It's coming in, right? But I can turn off this on and off. So basically, I'm getting pulsating flow out. So the rate of energy in might be constant, mass in. But I'm doing some pulsating type thing here so that the output is not. That's an example of a non-steady process. Now, if I were to just leave the valve open and the water comes in and it leaves and it's just running like that, and let's, you know, it's a water tank, so let's say it's, you know, a really, you know, they're all big, but so the mass coming into my system is not really influencing the mass of the, the water tank. There's so much mass there. Maybe I should use the ocean instead or something like that, but nevertheless. So the rate of mass coming in is staying constant in time. So given that this is the case, then my energy in dot does not equal my energy out dot, but energy in dot minus energy out dot equals This expression here is the rate form of the first law of thermodynamics. It's a statement on conservation of energy. So I have non-steady flow, another case. Constant volume, constant density. So I can write it out. Energy of the mass coming in, 1 half m1 v1 squared plus m1 g h1 plus m1 v1 v1 plus m1 v1. And I can do the same here. 1 half m2 
just as a question, what does P2 represent? What does P2 represent? Pressure at the second point. You said pressure, you're, you're getting there, but you pressure said something. Yeah. So that so I just want to make so yeah you're on the right. I want because it's an important distinction. P two is not the pressure within here. P two is the pressure within my elemental volume leaving. That's an important distinction. Remember, this represents the energy of mass leaving my system. So if the pressure increases. Right? The energy of the mass leaving increases. So I put this in rate form. I can write it like that. And I guess I can write up the whole thing. But it's kind of like this. Mainly I'm doing this just because to refresh you on calculus. So a constant density specific volume of the input equals the specific volume of the output. This represents the density within my control volume entering. Density, so it's constant density. Constant density. Well, given it's constant density, this, this works out right away. Plus simple case. Let's use these as the simple case. So if I turn on the hose to water a flower and I stand and don't do anything, right? And I just hold my hand right there. If I look at and use my hose as the boundary, right? Put a boundary around my hose, all of these apply. So I got some velocity input from right, sanitary. The pressure at the input is the same. The pressure of the water leaving is the same. So all of these, so all these are equal to zero. I held it at one elevation, so H2 is constant. 
And given that it's running, the temperature, I'm not cooling or heating that hose. It gets to a constant temperature. Okay. For holding it for a long time. Now we know when we take a shower, right? If I did energy balance on the faucet head, right? Before I'm taking a shower, we all know that the temperature is changing, right? We don't jump in right away. We wait till it warms up. But after a while, if we had a huge water heater, after we heated all the pipes, then, right, right here, this wouldn't be changing in time. But of course, when we first turn on the output from our faucet head on the shower head, this is changing in time. Now our input, right, all the piping in from the water heaters not changing. So using the simplified case, so I have my energy in my system, and I can break this up into a piece. So I have work in dot plus Q in dot plus M dot one, one half, then I got another piece. Energy, the rate of energy in, there's a work component, heat component, and a mass component. So I have Dot, dot, dot just implies you just change the subscripts, right? Two represents out. <coughs> so, right, so this is a case of non-steady. And I use the example of me turning on and off, right? <coughs> Opening and closing the valve. So I have my M dot in, my mass, my rate of mass coming into my system. This being a constant, but I'm opening and closing a valve, so this is changing. And as a consequence, you get some changes. 